Remember, folks, they claim the spray foam is a chemistry experiment. <laughs> this demonstration of spraying a typical polyurethane foam shows the high degree of reactivity of two liquid components being mixed and drawing to the touch in 15 seconds. This high degree of reactivity, preventing premixing and spraying with ordinary single component spray equipment, was the basis for specialized two component equipment and technology pioneered and developed by Gusmer Corporation to deal specifically with the unique problems inherent in these highly reactive systems. The equipment's ability to efficiently handle modern polyurethane spray systems has been tested and proven beyond any doubt. But just as specialized equipment is required, specialized knowledge, training, and experience in the use of the equipment are also required because of the overall mechanical and chemical complexities involved in the urethane foam production process. And with that, an industry was born. And the reason that I wanted to start this off with the uh, 1976 Gusmer training video is we'll be referring back to this throughout the the video that you're watching here is that 1966 is when Fred and Floyd Gusmer developed and patented, applied for patent, the plural component spray gun called the D-Gun, which was tied to their early model FF spray foam proportioning unit. And you were like, well, what do I care? Well, the industry was born by them birthed by them, created by them, on a standard fixed ratio, one to one by volume system. Up until that, then, uh, spray foam installation had largely been uh, left to the injection molding and uh, hollow cavity fill, but with plural component highly reactive one to one ratio, it was finally simple enough to install, provided that the right equipment was created, that spray applied polyurethane foam could be used. And now the world was unlocked for walls, roofs, floors, uh, overhead, not just injecting into cavities. So you need to understand that in order for an industry to be born, you need to have the experimentation phase over with. You need to have an, a standardized program of chemistry, uh, what your ratio is going to be, what the chemicals are going to be, how you're going to process it, at what temperatures you're going to need to process it, what pressures you're going to need to process it at, needs to be decided. Because if a patent is going to be issued on the spray gun and the application equipment, it is, is industry specific and it is going to be unique, right? So the machines in the spray foam world do not allow for changes. We don't get to turn a dial and mess with the ratio. Today I feel like putting a little bit more of A on instead of B. B, I don't have as much to go. I better thin this out. Likewise, I can't top up my drums with a garden hose. It's not water, it's not like paint. I can't thin it out. So when you get your drums, they are sealed. The chemistry is in them, you hook them up, you use a drum pump to move the product from the barrel to the back of the machine. The machine then pressurizes it, it then heats it up so that it can be atomized and sprayed and processed easily. And then it comes to this marvelous twin component spray gun that uh, Fred and Floyd Gusmer developed where equal parts volumetrically of A and B are met at the gun. There's a thousand PSI coming out at the spray head and when they are being mixed properly in the spray head there is a distinct color change and there's a distinct pattern that will come out of the gun and then the gun has a distinct feel to it. So if it's herky-jerky and off ratio I mean you're gonna physically feel it and you're gonna see it. So when the foam rises and it's sprayed, it sets in seconds, the chemistry is working, it's not an experiment. It's not something where it's hit and missed, did I make it work, did I add enough of this, did I didn't? It's not like baking a cake, you can't mess with the recipe. The recipe's already been decided, it's there, hook the machine up, turn everything on, with the exception of just like your car, does it got gas, does it have oil, does it have coolant, do I have air in the tires, right? And then do I know where I'm going? Do I have a map? Do I have directions? Do I know how to drive? Do I know the rules of the road? Do I have to pay attention when it's slippery out, foggy out, rainy out? Do I know how to merge into ongoing traffic or traffic that's already moving very fast? So these are the things that you would need to be considering driving a car. The same things that you consider when you are actually spraying foam. You have to take into account what your conditions are and what needs to have happen. 
In Canada, we have a master ULC specification. Underwriters Laboratory of Canada has written a standard for the foam and then the installers. And it was decided upon going back to 1985, what, uh, what foam are you gonna spray? What density is the foam gonna be done? Um, what insulating property should it have? Water vapor permeance, dimensional stability, adhesion, co-adhesion. Uh, all of these had to be agreed upon as an industry. And then a standard was written. Everybody had to come up to that standard. So if you wanna install in buildings that are gonna be under the National Building Code of Canada, you need a repeatable agreed upon product. So we have a ULC standard and that covers the product and its installation. It's a S705.1 for product and S705.2 for the installers. This is fixed in our building code. The building code of Canada, the NBC, references the ULC standard and then the suppliers have to meet a product and be issued a number of certification for their um, foam supply and then the installers are the mating of product and final installation. And we are actually technically installing and manufacturing, what we're manufacturing on site. So is this a experiment that could go horribly wrong? No. What we are doing is rather than the final process for insulation being done in a factory, the final process for the insulation is being done on site. And that is certified through CCMC. So what does that mean? It means that CCMC, Canadian Construction Materials Centre, has issued a certification number, a license number, if you will, to the manufacturer. The manufacturer then can only sell that product to a licensed, certified, trained installer. And then there's a third party that is going to audit the installers and audit and certify the manufacturers. Now, you can mess around with that program, you can falsify certain things, and you can be a crook, but the checks and balances have been placed in the industry to have a verified product and then a verified way of installing it. And we are technically manufacturers on site. And the idea is to issue a repeatable product that can be certified in building code and warranties can be issued and that it can be recognized as credible so that building architects and engineers and code specifiers uh, and even insurance and underwriting can issue an industry accreditation on this. Uh, building codes don't allow for experimentation. Like when we got certified and set up and we got working in our jurisdiction, we went around to all of the authorities having jurisdiction, educated them on foam. Many of them didn't know anything about it. We did miniature little lunch and learns and conferences at their their town halls and city halls and brought out suppliers and showed them what the product was got them up to speed so that when they saw it in the field they weren't gonna you know put a stop work order on us um, the equipment is the same as it was it's gotten more advanced just like a car has gotten more advanced from 1980 to 2023 but the equipment is more or less the same in what it has to achieve uh, the installer is nearly the same. You can talk to somebody who was spraying foam full-time in 1980 and they will understand the basic principles, one-to-one -one ratio of putting on closed cell or open cell uh, foam insulation to somebody that's been installing in 2020 or 2023. In North America alone, Canada and the U.S., spray foam installation, primarily closed cell, medium density, two-pound foam, is already very close to 50 years of old. 50 years of age. So to claim that the foam is new is wrong. To claim that it is a shifting sand of specification, certification is false. Uh, the industry has very much been locked in on open and closed cell foam for its entire existence. Uh, building codes have been written for it. Your local county, your local state will have it written in. This is the standard to what the manufacturers uh, produce their product to. You have a whole entire multi, multi billion dollar industry on the equipment manufacturer side. For instance, Graco Manufacturing, which a lot of people know in the paint industry, they are the largest spray foam equipment supplier, hoses, guns, parts. Uh, these are all certified, um, well manufactured, repeatable pieces of equipment. So I don't see how um, people can claim, as they do on the internet, they can try, but 
we debunked this with facts. I don't see how you can have a, a repeatable industry on the equipment side, the manufacturing side, and the building code side that is recognized by suppliers, manufacturers, lobby groups, right? Code officials, specification writers, architects, engineers. I've had architects and engineers specify closed cell foam for hospitals and commercial buildings all the time and then insurance and underwriting and we will get into the insurance and the underwriting because there's been a lot of claims about insurance and mortgages not being granted or honored uh, with closed cell or open cell foam in certain situations a lot of that is very very false uh, because people are making wide accusations based on rumors or specific instances of failure where something was wasn't entertained so uh, and honored. So what we're going to do here today is we're going to wrap this up. I've shown you the data. It's very verifiable that this this is very much a large industry that I'm a part of and speaking on behalf of. And to uh, close out, for those of you that are interested, if you are a sprayer watching this, I will put on the last few minutes of the uh, Gusmer training video from 1976. Some old nostalgia watching the old D-gun and the old hydraulic and air-powered proportioning units. And for those of you that came in here to find out whether or not this is something credible to be placing into your project, thank you for watching the video this far. Leave me a comment. I would love to read it. I'll respond to the ones that I can. Leave a comment. Click subscribe if you're so inclined. And we will see you on the next couple of videos as we wrap up this series on fake news. Good day. This demonstration of spraying a typical polyurethane foam shows the high degree of reactivity of two liquid components being mixed and drawing to the touch in 15 seconds. This high degree of reactivity preventing premixing and spraying with ordinary single component spray equipment was the basis for specialized two component equipment and technology pioneered and developed by Gusmer Corporation to deal specifically with the unique problems inherent in these highly reactive systems. The equipment's ability to efficiently handle modern polyurethane spray systems has been tested and proven beyond any doubt. But just as specialized equipment is required, specialized knowledge, training, and experience in the use of the equipment are also required because of the overall mechanical and chemical complexities involved in the urethane foam production process. each chapter corresponding to a particular piece of your equipment. Now let's look at how urethane foam is produced in the spray process and some of the properties which characterize a quality product. The reactive material sprayed from the gun is a completely mixed combination of two liquids which must be continuously supplied to the gun at an exact ratio. The term ratio describes the relative volumes of polymeric isocyanate and polyol based resin usually referred to simply as A and B components, which must be mixed together in order to obtain the specific foam properties the chemical system is formulated to produce. In slow motion, notice that the mixed materials immediately begin chemical reaction. The products of this reaction are polyurethane plastic and heat, or exotherm, which causes a low boiling liquid blowing agent dissolved in the resin to vaporize and expand. The expanding gas becomes trapped in the polyurethane plastic causing the liquid to foam up and rise to about 30 times its original thickness. The time required between spray and full rise is then defined as the rise time of the foam system. After the complete rise has taken place, the polyurethane plastic, still in its liquid state, forms a solid skin at the outer surface, which becomes dry or tack-free to the touch. The time required for the tack-free skin to form is then called the tack-free time of the foam system. Rise time and tack-free time are usually specified at room temperature application. Many systems are supplied with faster rise and tack-free times for low temperature applications and slower rise and tack-free times for high application temperatures. A quality foam product will be composed of many uniform small cells, which, because of their closed cell structure, will retain the blowing agent gas that gives urethane foam its superior insulating qualities. Poorly mixed, off-ratio foam has a noticeably different cell structure. 
The non-uniform, large open cells give this foam less rigidity and strength, allow absorption of moisture, and result in reduced insulating qualities, thereby creating an all-round inferior foam product. Foam density, which describes how much a cubic foot of foam would weigh, is a method used to describe different types of foam systems. Two pounds per cubic foot foam, or simply two pound density foam, has been the most widely used foam to date, primarily as an insulating material. Half pound density foam is ideal for use as a packaging material because of its lightweight and flexible strength characteristics. Higher density foams, such as five pound density, are used where greater strength requirements must be met. The foam mechanic's single most important piece of equipment is the spray gun, which he uses to actually manufacture the foam directly from the liquid raw materials. As stated earlier, it is a two-component spray gun, the two liquid components being separately supplied to the gun where material flow, mix, and spray can be started and stopped by actuation of the trigger. This visible model mixing chamber shows that the two materials, here represented by red and green, are kept separate by a movable valving rod, which upon actuation of the trigger, withdraws from the mixing chamber and uncovers the material inlets, allowing the two liquids to simultaneously rush in. The injection force of the liquids as they enter the mixing chamber from opposite but slightly offset injection slots causes a combination of impingement and rotary motion of the liquids within the mixing chamber. This motion simultaneously mixes the two liquids and creates airless atomization of the mixture into a spray pattern. To shut the gun off, the rod is merely pushed forward to its original position, simultaneously valving the incoming flow of both materials as the rod slides past the injection slots and displaces or pushes out the remainder of mixed material, leaving the mixing chamber free of mixed material and ready for the next spray cycle. The two most important requirements of the gun for manufacturing a quality foam product are continuous flow of both materials up to and through the mixing chamber and accurate ratio control of the two liquids as they are supplied to the gun. Of nearly equal importance to the spray gun, therefore, is the proportioning unit, which controls ratio and maintains continuous flow of both liquid components to the gun through the use of double-acting, positive displacement, piston-type pumps. The name double acting means that pumping action is achieved on both the upstroke and the downstroke so that only one pump is required for continuous flow of each liquid. Positive displacement refers to each pump's ability to pump forward a predetermined fixed volume of fluid on each stroke. The coordinated action of two positive displacement pumps by a common drive system establishes accurate proportioning of the materials at the fixed volume ratio required by the chemical formulation. Since these are very specialized, reactive materials, certain precautions must be taken in every phase of material storage, handling, and use.